From CBS 2 News, this is a special report. Governor Murphy is giving an update on the coronavirus outbreak in New Jersey. Let's listen in. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be joined by the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, the state's epidemiologist, another person who's known to everyone, Dr. Christina Tan. To my left, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Preparedness, Jared Maples is in the house. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start, if I can, by giving a fuller picture of the efforts at the Department of Labor to get unemployment benefits into the hands of every worker who deserves them. Over the past two weeks, the department has added 193,000 to the roles of unemployed workers receiving benefits, for a total of 622,000 people now receiving unemployment benefits from our state. Another half a billion dollars in payments went out the door last week for a total of $1.4 billion and rising. The unresolved claims are mostly, and I say mostly, not entirely, but mostly from the pool of approximately 200,000 individuals who are self-employed, independent contractors, or gig workers who filed for benefits under the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, or PUA. Those claims are starting to be processed literally today and will be over the weekend, bringing hundreds of millions of additional dollars to New Jerseyans' wallets and significantly reducing the number of claimants who had not yet received benefits. We will update you when we can on the department's progress, but the department can only release new unemployment numbers on Thursdays, and that is according to the U.S. Department of Labor rules. It is also important to remember that even in normal times, it takes three weeks approximately to process an unemployment claim after all the required information is received. When claims are coming in in the tens or hundreds of thousands a week, the denominator of those who have not received benefits yet is always going to be a big number. It takes longer when there is missing income information or when there's a separate claim filed in another state. But I note, as I have said before, a couple of things. Number one, we appreciate uh, your patience and we appreciate even your frustration as you've been waiting to get through. But also, as importantly, uh, that every New Jerseyan eligible for unemployment benefits will receive every dollar, every penny they qualify for. Let's switch gears and go to today's numbers and let this never be just about numbers. Today, we're announcing another 2,651 positive test results for a statewide total of 121,190. If you look at the graph, these numbers keep moving over time and overall in the right direction. As I mentioned on Monday, we can't get distracted by one day spikes or drops. We have to look at the trend lines. Likewise, the map of New Jersey we have turned to daily continues to get lighter as the rate of doubling of new cases continues to slow. And again, the, the, the counties that are the least amount of days to double continue to be in the south. And two things about those counties, and Judy would want me to say this, number one, uh, they have meaningful cases, but much fewer cases there than they do in those northern counties. And secondly, um, the virus, as we have always uh, signaled, is, is migrating, including down uh, to the southern counties, and more on that in a second. And it bears repeating, I can't say this strongly enough, this weekend will be a huge test for all of us as to whether or not we stay on this trajectory. As we reopen our parks and as some of you head back to the golf course, social distancing is going to be the watchword. We will be closely monitoring actions across the entire weekend. I know the overwhelming majority of you will head out, will do the right things and keep our parks therefore open going forward. But if we see what we saw, and this was extremely troubling, uh, over the first weekend in April when we had good weather and we closed the parks after that, 
uh, we saw a lot of the so-called knucklehead behavior with people ignoring social distancing. And if we see that again, uh, we will not hesitate, and I don't say this with any joy, to reclose the parks. I sincerely do not want to do that. I recognize we all want to be out in the fresh air and sunshine. That includes me, by the way. But we are not out of the woods yet. We all still have to use common sense. So please, no gatherings. Stay at least six feet apart. Wear, we're not making you, but I'm asking you to wear a face covering. And on the golf side, similar, but there's a lot of other specifics we need you to adhere to, like one person per cart, uh, twosomes, uh, etc. So you can look that up in our executive order. We are trusting in you to keep up with your social just distancing, just as you have been trusting in us in this battle against COVID-19. Let's show everybody how New Jersey responds, by the way, and so far, overwhelmingly so good. So please, let's have a big weekend together. In our health care system, as of last night's reporting, there were 5,972 patients hospitalized for COVID-19. This number happily continues to decrease. But let's remember, folks, it is still just under 6,000 people in a hospital bed right now with COVID-19. This graph shows by region how many patients our, hospital, our hospitals are treating. North Jersey and Central Jersey, as you can see, continue to see a downward trend. And South Jersey is up a bit, but has seen a relative leveling over the past five days. Let's stay on this for a second. Let me, so this is, this is what we saw a couple of days ago when we showed you. And note not just the shape of the curves, but also the amount of cases. So you see in the north, you're, you've got 3,000 and something, it looks like, uh, hospitalizations as of the moment. You've got high 1,000 and seven or 700 or so in the central region. You've got, even though the curve is not, a, is not going down, yet it's beginning to flatten in the south, it is still below 1,000 in total. Um, so our hope is not only that that curve in the south, that the north and central continue to flatten, that the south levels and flattens and the numbers overall stay uh, low. Our field medical stations reported 46 patients and they have treated a total of 380 of our fellow New Jerseyans since opening. There were 1,724 patients reported in either critical or intensive care, and this continues the overall trend from last week. Ventilator use currently stands at 1,286, and this is relatively, Judy, I think unchanged since yesterday. There were 532 new hospitalizations yesterday, and on discharges, 571 live patients were released from our hospitals yesterday, another day over day increase, but spa pause there for a second. 532 people as of 10, between 10 p.m. and 10 p.m. entered a hospital in New Jersey. So I want to open this place up as fast as anybody, but we have to keep in mind there are still a lot of people in hospitals and going into hospitals. The numbers are better, but they're not zero. And we need to get them there as fast as possible. Again, the numbers are showing positive trends. And these are the trends that we will need to see carried over in the coming weeks if we are to put ourselves on that road back and begin the restart of our economy. And again, I understand that people and businesses are anxious for a more specific timetable for when we can restart and begin to move forward. By the way, so am I. It's this simple. In addition to the precious lives, data determines dates. That means when we see our benchmarks on key factors like testing or hospitalizations, we could begin considering a specific timetable. But again, data determines dates. And I cannot stress enough how big a test this weekend will be in terms of keeping these trend lines moving in the right direction. And if you will, essentially an experiment on how we can together responsibly take that step forward. Even if it may be a baby step, it's an important one to get into our parks, to play golf, to see how we do. And if we do well together, uh, then we can most likely take other steps sooner than later. So let's do this together, folks. Today, with the heaviest of hearts, as we do every day, we are reporting 311 additional deaths from COVID-19. Our statewide total is now unspeakably 7,538 precious lives lost. As is our practice, let's honor some of those 
precious souls who we have lost. First, let's bring up a giant, Dr. Harvey Hirsch, a longtime and beloved pediatrician at the Center for Health Education, Medicine, and Dentistry in Lakewood. He was also a fixture at Mon Monmouth Medical Center. My wife was uh, formerly on the board there, and while did, she did not know him personally, she said he was, quote unquote, a legend at Monmouth Medical. He was known for his kindness and compassion and the respect he showed his patients and their families. He had been a practicing pediatrician for more than, than 30 years, recognized by New Jersey Monthly Magazine with its top doctor award in 2011, and by New Jersey Family Magazine as our state's favorite kids doctor in 2012. Look at the smile, Judy, look at the stethoscope, look at the tie, what a mensch. Despite concerns about his being exposed to COVID-19, he insisted on continuing to care for every patient who came for help, regardless, by the way, of whether or not they were a regular patient. And we lost him to COVID-19 on Tuesday. To Dr. Hirsch's wife, Mrs. Yehudis Simka Hirsch, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last night, she said a blessing for her was that all of their children were in and around her in Lakewood. And to everyone he cared for, may his memory be a blessing. Matthew Stare of Denville. Matthew looks like he's in a Mission Impossible movie there. Look at that. I love that. He spent nearly 18 years working in the Morris County Clerk's Office, most recently as assistant supervisor in the registry department, tracking real estate and historical documents. He is the first Morris County employee to pass from COVID-19. County Clerk Ann Grossi recalled Matt as a quote-unquote exemplary employee with quote-unquote genuine enthusiasm and as someone who took on any task. In fact, Matt enjoyed undertaking labor-intensive projects like a complete reorganization of the county clerk's map room, as well as the cataloging of county real estate and historical records. I spoke with Matt's mother, Marty, yesterday, and that was, as you could imagine, a tough conversation to express our condolences to her and her family and all of Matt's friends. In fact, Matt's brother, Michael, his big, big brother, Michael, is also battling COVID-19 and recently was moved out of ICU. And so please, everybody, pray for Michael's continued recovery. His little brother, Matt, was only 38 years old, and his mom described what it was like telling big brother Michael about his little brother's passing, and it, it doesn't get any more emotional than that. God bless them all. And this is Cherie La, La Palusa. She was the beloved wife of a friend, Bayonne Third Ward Councilman Gary La Palusa. Sherry was a Bayonne original, born and raised. She is co-owner of her husband's landscaping business, and she also, pardon me, she was co-owner of her husband's landscaping business, and she also ran his civic association, organizing food and toy drives and dinners to celebrate the people making a difference in the community. And Gary is a guy that I've walked the streets of Bayonne with uh, together on more than one occasion. Uh, along with her husband, Gary, Sherry leaves behind her daughters, Jennifer, Gianna, and two sons, David and Gary Jr. As, as Gary said to me, we got four kids, three adults and a 12-year-old, and Gianna is the 12-year-old. And to each of the four of them and to Gary, our hearts and prayers uh, go out to you. And by the way, Sher Sherry was only 53 years old and was in the midst of the battle of her life, not just with her own health, but her mom is also battling this awful thing. Uh, and, and it was unspeakable. You know, Gary said there, he, there she was trying to save her mom's life, and, and, and in fact, she lost her own. So to, to Sherry, to Gary, to Sherry's mom, who's in our prayers, to their four wonderful kids and everybody they touched in Bayonne and beyond, God bless you all. These are three more of the faces COVID-19 has forever taken from us. We remember each and every single one. Again, as I said yesterday, more New Jerseyans than we have lost in most of our nation's wars and other cataclysmic events combined. It's a staggering toll. 
And I remind you that our flags continue to fly at half staff for all of them. And today, which is the first time this has ever happened since I've been governor, I signed an executive order that the flags today, in addition to all the victims of COVID-19, would be flying at half staff in the memory of former First Lady Debbie Keene, who passed last weekend. So to her, as our state's former First Lady, and to her husband, the former governor, and, and their children, including Senator Kane, God bless each and every one of them, and God bless uh, the families of those who have been lost and the memories and the blessings of the, those who have been lost to COVID-19. And may we all together continue our work together to stop this awful scourge and bring this to an end. Switching gears, today I am signing an executive order relaxing the in-person requirements for both the solemnization of marriage licenses for couples and for working papers for minors. On marriages, wedding ceremonies will be allowed to be held using video conferencing technology with certain safeguards. Municipalities are still permitted to allow in-person ceremonies but subject to social distancing, but they will not be required to do so. Even in these times, there are joyous occasions like marriages that we can still celebrate safely and smartly. And for working papers, the requirement that school uh, that school a district, a district designated individual given person sign off is waived for this emergency. Obviously, the fact that our schools remain closed has made getting required sign offs on these papers challenging for young people who wish to work. And as today is May 1st, May Day, I might add, I want to remind all renters that under an executive order I signed last week, you are able to have your security deposit used to cover your rent either in part or in full. I read an op-ed by a citizen today in the Asbury Park Press that called me a despot. Uh, and I read the first couple of paragraphs to determine why I would be considered a despot. Uh, and it was the fact that I allow folks to get access to their security deposit. Okay. I also want to reiterate that no renters are to be threatened with eviction throughout this emergency and under no circumstances may any landlord even attempt to evict a tenant. No one should fear losing their home. In fact, we have set up a standalone page for renters and landlords on our information hub, covid19.nj.gov slash renter. I encourage you to make that your first stop. Before I th turn things over to Judy, I wanna give a couple of well-deserved thank yous to some of our fellow New Jerseyans who continue to pitch in to help us through this emergency. First, Let's meet Brooklyn Sherrill and Sam Halseth of Ocean City. They own a digital marketing firm called Shoreview Creative. But they're taking their creativity in new directions by organizing an eBay auction of one-of-a-kind custom-painted sneakers. And all proceeds will go to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the World Health organization. And by the way, this is kind of cool, neither Brooklyn nor Sam are native New Jerseyans. They moved here two years ago, each of them and their families from Minnesota. But they are now full-fledged members of our New Jersey family. And to each of them, New Jersey thanks you. If you look carefully, I assume that's Sam on the right. I just hope Michelangelo does not uh, sue for copyright infringement. I think that's a version of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, but those are extraordinary. Uh, look at them, just alive with energy, look, very cool sneakers. Uh, give, give them uh, your attention and sign up and participate in that auction and raise some money for an incredibly good cause. And finally, here's one from my neck of the woods and a place I know well, the Two River Theater in Red Bank. To support health care and social workers across Monmouth County, the costume shop staff, led by Leslie Sorensen, has taken to repurposing materials and outfits from past shows into masks. Additionally, the theater has been keeping its art mission alive by producing its own online daily artist features, at-home activities for kids and adults, and live digital classes and workshops. So to everyone at the Two River Theater, a particular shout out to founder Joan Recknitz and God bless her late husband, Bob Recknitz, who passed not that long ago. 
to our artistic director and other dear friend, John Diaz, to everybody there, thank you for all you're doing to keep the arts alive and well, even if we can't visit you in person, which I hope we can do sometime soon. And that's as good a place as any to get ready to turn this, the, the, the program over. But before I do, again, I want to say again, please, remember this weekend is going to be an important one for us and an important sign for how we move forward and at what pace we move forward and get ourselves on the road back to restart and recovering. When the parks open tomorrow, please act responsibly and follow the rules and precautions. I want us all to be able to enjoy our parks together, even if we have to remain six feet apart and even if we have to speak through face coverings. What I don't want to do, please, God, I don't want to have to close those parks again. So let's do what you've been doing so extraordinarily well for these past so many weeks. Let's make this work together. And with that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Uh, thank you. of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Well, with the opening of parks and golf courses this weekend, I think it's time to remind you all of our basics. Visit parks that are close to your home. Stay at least six feet from others. Bring hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Wash your hands frequently. Face masks, cloth, ones, are strongly encouraged. Practice respiratory etiquette. Avoid gathering with others outside of your household. Don't visit crowded parks where you cannot appropriately distance from others. Don't obviously visit a park if you're sick or if you have recently been exposed to someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Don't use the playground or participate in organized sports or congregate with others. This number has been in a steady decline. It is down 28% from a high of 8,293 individuals hospitalized on April 14th. There are 1,724 individuals in critical care. 75% of those individuals are on ventilators, which is slightly up from yesterday. Today we're reporting 2,651 new cases uh, for a total of 121,190 cases in the state, and we're reporting 311 additional deaths for a total of 7,538 fatalities. The breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity is as follows. White, 52.6%. Black, 19.6, Hispanic, 17.3, Asian, 5.3, other, 5.2. There are now 498 long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, dementia homes in the state that are reporting individuals with COVID-19. At the state veterans' homes, among a census of 696 residents uh, collectively, there have been 327 residents that have tested positive. And there have been four additional deaths from yesterday, two from Menlo Park and two from Paramus. At our state psychiatric hospitals, 161 patients have tested positive. And there have been nine deaths among patients uh, with a census of uh, 1,257. And that has not changed for the last several days. According to our lab data, uh, 2, uh, 229,693 individuals have been tested. 94,338 have returned positive for a positivity rate of 41.7%. So that concludes my daily report. Uh, again, uh, please continue to follow social distancing guidelines. It's making a difference. Stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Judy, thank you for that, and thank you for everything. The top counties, as we normally hit 
um, in terms of total positive cases, Bergen followed by Hudson, Essex, Passaic, Union, Middlesex. I spoke to a, had an exchange this morning with Mayor Brian Stack in Union City. You know, the, while, and you, we've, we've said this, the curves continue to go in the right direction, but you know, you're piling up uh, every day. Uh, and again, we're expanding testing dramatically, so that's part of the reason, uh, but we're not out of the woods yet, uh, right? The positivity number, just to remind everybody, it's now really going on two weeks that that's begun. Drift is the word I would use, right? It's been drifting from a high of around 45% down to about 41.1% today. So, and thank you for the reminders of the little stuff that we have to do, uh, the, the very basic things that we have to make sure we're continuing to do. Let's not lose track of that. Staying away from each other, wearing face coverings, good hygiene, those are all uh, the best weapons we've got. So thank you for that. Uh, another guy who I don't know where we'd be without, uh, Pat Callahan, please update us on compliance, on PPE infrastructure, other matters. I know there's one situation in particular you wanted to uh, give, give some clarity to that happened in Trenton here last night. So please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. With regard to overnight compliance, Newark Police Department issued 69 EO violations and closed one non-essential business in Point Pleasant. One subject was cited for having uh, the gym open, allowing uh, clients to exercise in New Brunswick. One subject was cited for the EO violation failing to disperse in Passaic. Uh, a subject was also uh, failed to disperse and was cited for an EO violation in Mansfield Township, Warren County. The owner of a nail salon was cited for operating a non-essential business uh, in Patterson, uh, the owner was cited for having uh, a non-essential furniture store open uh, in Patterson. Two subjects were cited uh, for also failing to disperse in Passaic. The owner, as well as two customers, were cited in violation of the EO for uh, one the owner having a massage parlor open and to the two customers inside for uh, for uh, for being in it while uh, when the police arrived. In Clinton, I'll end with this one because it segues into another issue. In Clinton, uh, an elderly subject was contacted, uh, and this is a scam that we've seen a lot. It's not new, but I think the social distancing and, and physical and, and psychological isolation is having those prey upon our elderly with regard to what's referred to as a bail scam, saying that uh, her grandson was lodged in bail and needed $5,000. The subject did actually put $5,000 in the mail. That was subsequently stopped by the U.S. Postal Service. Um, but I just want to put it out there from a, a situ situational awareness. Uh, no one should be, be sending uh, via mail or wiring funding. I know the Attorney General's uh, the task force they put together with regard to fraud are looking into this. Um, and again, it's not a particularly new scam, but, um, but I think they're preying upon uh, the elderly in a time when that isolation uh, leads to the elderly wanting to take care of their loved ones. So I just flag that for, for everybody out there. And lastly, to the governor's point with regard to the incident last night uh, at the Anderson Funeral Home, just to clarify a few facts with regards to that, there was a total of 18 decedents, not uh, 19 as previously reported. Uh, state police personnel, in addition to Trenton Police and the Mercer County prosecutor's office did respond there. There was not to be found anything of any criminal violation uh, under the uh, after the assessment done by state police personnel and the others there. The Anderson Funeral Home transported 11 of those decedents to the central temporary morgue site. Uh, I think it should be noted that Anderson uh, had previously used that temporary morgue site as well. So it's they did know it was there. This was uh, simply a, a case where they just got overwhelmed. Seven of the decedents were permitted to remain there because their funeral service are being held over the course of the next three days. Uh, just And in response to that, we had re-messaged what we had put out over the last few weeks to the Funeral Directors Association, New Jersey Hospitals Association, long-term care, as well as our county OEMs. All of the guidance that we put into uh, the efforts, and I know you've heard me speak to it over the past several weeks on mortuary affairs. Not a, not a topic we want to discuss, but we have spent a lot of time and resources to help assist uh, 
all of those that are struggling with uh, with the death associated with this brutal virus. And I just wanted to remind every a buddy of that and set the record straight with regard to what happened last night at Anderson Funeral Home. Governor. Pat, thank you, and I appreciate your doing that. Um, two quick comments. We'll start, Brendan, over here with Dustin for our, before we do, go to questions. Um, two quick points. You've been listening to Governor Murphy give an update on the coronavirus outbreak in New Jersey. We're now returning to regular programming on CBS2. For extended local news coverage, stick with our streaming service, CBSN New York. This has been a special report from CBS2 News. We now return to our regular programming.